dear old, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Petros and I head the European Movement Office here in Brussels. And we have gathered today to discuss something that is remarkably important. It has become more so over the past year due to the lockdown we're all experiencing. But the question of uh, the digital dimension of campaigning and organizing has been with us for a while. Uh, we have seen that the fight for the hearts and minds of citizens has moved to the digital domain and a variety of actors are competing there with varied degrees of success. The one thing, though, that is concerning is that the European civil society hasn't been able to really caught up in this fight. And as a result, we might be losing in many areas. For that reason, we have decided to organize this event together with our partners Tectonica to see how European civil society can take advantage of the opportunities that the digital domain offer in its effort to promote a much more progressive, inclusive and equal society. And for that purpose, uh, we have invited uh, Ned Howey, who is uh, the CEO of Tectonita and the author of this report, to take us through some of the findings they have come up with, but also some of the suggestions that they would put forward to civil society and others, how to make the most of digital organizing and campaigning. And alongside him, to support with uh, the discussion and to share their inputs, we have to great leaders in that field. Uh, Rebecca Yuska, she's an analyst at GQR, and she will be also commenting on the report. And Lison Lesu, she's, the, she's an account manager for Nation Builder, uh, one of the biggest uh, software platforms uh, that has been working with a variety of uh, players, first in the US, then in the UK, and increasingly across Europe uh, to help organizations engage with digital campaigning. So, without more delay, uh, Ned, Rebecca, perhaps I should uh, give you the floor so you can tell us about the report, but also then we can start discussing a bit more practical aspects of digital organizing for civil society. Ned. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Petros, and, and thank you to EMI for the invitation to speak on this panel. This is obviously something that's incredibly important to us, and um, I'm very happy to be speaking here uh, with Lison from from Nation Builder, um, who was one of the also the sponsors on the on the report that we did, um, as well as Rebecca, who was uh, our from GQR, who was one of our partners and who helped us really pull in a lot of information that was. Um, you know, at a really high level of quality for the data and being able to, to come out with findings from this report that uh, are very meaningful. So um, I'm going to start with the report because um, and why we did this report. Basically, uh, in the last year, we found that there's a varying kind of understanding of what digital campaigning and digital organizing is um, with folks that we're talking to across Europe. Um, Tectonica Digital Campaign Studios, uh, while we started in Buenos Aires, Argentina, we've actually been located in uh, Barcelona for two years now. Um, and uh, you know, as we've talked to folks kind of in civil society, NGOs, unions, political parties, uh, we found that there seems to be a varying kind of understanding of what digital organizing is, what the value of it is, and what its potential is. And so this past year, along with GQR, we decided to launch into, um, into this report. I'm going to walk you through a few of these slides to show you some of the information. Our main premise here, our main concept with the report was basically to try to determine and understand uh, what the general state of digital organizing was across Europe. And so our main thesis that we're trying to, to, to grasp was, is there really a potential for digital organizing in Europe? And what activities are currently uh, happening across Europe? Um, Rebecca is going to talk a little bit now about uh, how, we, how we went about doing this. Um, so I'll pass it to her. Great. Uh, thank you, Ned, and thank you, Petros, for having me. Um, my name is Rebecca. I am an analyst with GQR working out of our London office. Uh, we are a global consultancy on opinion research, strategy, and communications. Um, before we dive into the uh, research findings, I thought I'd take a uh, quick look at uh, what the research actually consisted of um, that formed the basis of this report. Um, so the report was informed by an online survey of 150 individuals from progressive organizations across Europe. Uh, these were civil society organizations, political parties, uh, and unions, ideologically on the center and the left, all working towards uh, economic, social, and or environmental justice. Um, so our respondents were sourced from an ambitious mapping effort conducted by Tectonica, where they identified over 1,100 organizations across Europe that met this criteria. 
Uh, and then these people formed the basis of our survey participant pool. Um, as far as content, uh, GQR drafted the survey incorporating feedback from a uh, July workshop with um, 33 leading organizers from Europe to discuss trends in the field and develop a, a definition of digital organizing. Um, the workshop was then followed by a series of uh, in-depth interviews um, with digital organizing practitioners um, where we got their reactions to those definitions of digital organizing um, as well as to different behaviors that may comprise uh, digital organizing practices. Um, and then their input then informed the content and scope of our survey. Um, so who took our survey? 71% um, of the survey sample came from NGOs in the social sector, 15% uh, from political parties and 8% from unions. Um, about half of our respondents came from uh, Western Europe and 19% uh, from organizations who spanned uh, multiple countries or what we called uh, pan-European. Um, I will pass it back to Ned to take you through, um, or my turn still to go through the yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> you're still for, for the first of the key learnings. Keeping me on my toes. Um, right, so what did we learn? Um, I think it should start by saying just how critical this type of research is. Um, during these times. Obviously, um, big ticket item recently was the US presidential election. Um, and with COVID, we saw a massive shift to online campaigning, which of course brought with it um, massive disinformation efforts from the right. Um, and these are trends that are likely to come to Europe or in some instances um, have already arrived. Um, and as we'll see in the report findings, progressives really have significant ground to make up against the right um, when it comes to their digital organizing efforts both in fighting disinformation, but also just strengthening their own um, digital organizing practices. Um, and our survey results show quite clearly that the right is winning online. Um, so 43% of people say that the right is running better digital campaigns compared to only 33% who say progressives are doing better. Um, and some of this has to do with what the right is putting online. Um, so many interviewees reported that uh, simple emotionally triggering messaging is much easier to convey, uh, repeat, and, and of course multiply, especially on social media. And this gives a natural advantage to uh, some of those uh, movements that are entering the political spectrum. Um, meanwhile, some of the progressive mes messaging has been uh, to date much more complex and is sometimes harder to convey effectively online. Um, so the right is doing good things, but there's also a lack of best practices amongst progressives, which will become clear um, when we look at the, the extent to which they're utilizing components of that digital organizing framework, um, which Ned will now take you through. So one of the things that we had to do, thank you so much, Rebecca, is it basically we started this by saying, well, you know, what is actually digital organizing? There is not one solid definition of what is digital organizing. It's a, it's a term that's used sometimes as an umbrella term to describe everything within kind of digital activism or digital engagement. Um, other folks really have very thin specific definition of it that's just about like actual activists organizing. And so we decided first, before we really launched in to understand what people are doing um, online, that we needed some kind of a framework that would understand the kind of whole universe of potential online actions that people could be doing with advocacy work, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's, uh, NGOs doing that advocacy work or whether it's political parties or, or campaigns. And so, um, what we ended up doing is basically talking to a lot of people within the industry, gathering them, talking to them, and looking at the kind of entire universe of potential online actions. Um, and out of this, we developed the five-part framework here at Tectonica. And uh, this framework, what we heard very clearly is that the best way to kind of map and understand online actions for, for politics is in a way that is um, both kind of accordance with personalization of the action and decentralization of decision-making. Um, and so we developed this framework that, that kind of maps all the different potential world of online actions that could be from kind of the more top-down centralized ways, such as uh, broadcast communications and social media. And there's lots of people that think just that is uh, digital organizing, honestly. Um, but we know that there's a lot more that is more personalized and more decentralized. Uh, the next kind of category out, general category, is mobilizing. And within that, we see recruitment, this building, and engagement. 
um, where people really are using digital tools to basically grow their lists, um, to engage people to have a set of data that they uh, have an audience to talk to. And further out from that, we have audience segmentation and organizing directed activism. This is where we're using digital tools to really scale and bring relationships closer. So you'll see things like email segmentation. Um, you'll see things that are basically helping folks become more involved and more engaged, a lot of automations within those things. Um, and then the kind of uh, step out from there is really within the territory of what we would consider uh, what we would consider actual organizing. And so this is organizing on the online sense. We have two categories, one of which is supporter-based organizing, which is really where a, the organization or the party or the union kind of determine uh, the topic or the theme that's gonna be done. But really there's a degree of content and strategy that is developed by uh, supporters, activists, individuals in the community itself. And the furthest one out and most decentralized one being uh, this fully decentralized organizing, which is really a model that, uh, you know, in, in its in its most ideal sense, really the issues actually coming from the most grassroots level, and the uh, organization actually is is accountable to the to the either autonomous groups or autonomous individuals who are basically uh, kind of running the show, for lack of a better term. Um, so what we did we we created this framework and we asked people about kind of what are the different actions that you're actually doing um, online. We didn't ask the specifics of this framework. We didn't present it in, in the study itself, but we asked the specifics of their actions. And then we went back and we ordered those different actions into map them, basically, the responses into this framework itself. And the responses was really incredible because we first asked people, what should feature in a campaign? What do you think these are, you know, most of our respondents are folks running digital programs. And, and what should feature in a, in a campaign itself? And um, and then we asked them, what is your campaign actually featuring? And what was really interesting was when we asked people what should feature in a campaign, it was very clear that across the kind of framework here, that there was a good blend or mix of what people thought should be featured in campaigns all across the spectrum of kind of from top down broadcast to full decentralized organizing. And this matches what kind of social scientists like Harry Hahn have said that there's, you know, for civic organizations, the blend of mobilizing and organizing tend to be the ones that actually have the most impact and effect. But when we ask people across Europe in these different uh, in these different places, what uh, were they actually featuring in campaigns? The result was startlingly different. And that's this bottom line here. If you look at really the only one that was even close to what people felt should be featuring in a campaign was broadcast communications and social media. And there's a strong kind of parting of ways, the more decentralized you get, the greater difference between what people felt should be featured, the kinds of actions should be featured, and the actions that people were actually practicing in their campaigns. And so we learned that, uh, you know, basically we're, we're not even really doing what we should be doing in terms of our online actions um, out there. Uh, yeah, so we we also, we, we wanted to find out, well, why is there, there this difference between what people think should feature in a digital organizing practice and what is actually featuring in a, a digital organizing practice. Um, and what we did is we um, showed people this list of uh, barriers and asked them to pick uh, the three that are the, the biggest barriers to a uh, successful digital organizing operation. Um, and the biggest surprise for me is that you'd expect perhaps lack of funding to be the, the top of the list, um, when what we're seeing in reality is um, low levels of education on digital organizing best practices as the number one barrier to a, a successful digital organizing campaign uh, that was cited by 39% of our survey sample. Um, and I think these results also tie back to um, my previous point that it's, it's not just that the right is doing better, but that progressives themselves are not doing well enough. Um, so barriers that have to do with um, right-wing and populist voices um, rank sixth. Uh, so right-wing and populist voices have more cut through online um, and 10th on the list that is um, uh, digital tools are structured to uh, favor, I'm sorry, that's disinformation campaigns. 12th on the list is digital tools are structured to favor fear and hate-based uh, messaging. Um, so why is this the case? Um, we also asked people where they're learning about digital organizing best practices. Um, and surprisingly, 13% of people said that they're receiving no formal training on digital organizing. So they're just not getting that information. 
Uh, we also asked people to list organizations who are excelling at digital organizing right now. And what we saw was that the most common answer was either don't know or NA. So many people struggled just to give examples of who's doing good digital organizing. Um, so I think these results really show a big vacuum where people are lacking both the resources and information for how to uh, improve their digital organizing uh, practices. Uh. Our kind of uh, recommendations that come out of this in the, in the report itself, which I recommend everyone check out, uh, we do more extensive kind of recommendations and go into them talking about specifically for funders as well as for organizations. Um, for where we need to go from this. Um, but kind of the quick version of our recommendations coming out of this was that we need, obviously, as a, as a progressive community doing organizing, more communication, sharing, and relationship building so that you know we don't have situations where people don't know what campaigns are doing well or, or don't have the opportunity to learn or, or they're not learning you know, at all. Um, obviously, we need to see much more development of evidence-based uh, you know, best practices basically for digital organizing. This is somewhere, this is a generally a very new field in a lot of ways, kind of seeing its real foundation around 14 years ago. And while we might not expect kind of a, a master's in, in digital organizing, like we see in PR communications, we know that its role is extremely important right now. And considering that importance, it has a very low set of actual founded best practices that people can point to and say, that's doing the right thing. And what we see, as Rebecca pointed out, a lot of people are basing their practices on what other people are doing rather than what we know is working. And so a lot of kind of the not best practices are being copied just because they exist, not because they necessarily have proven efficacy. We also believe strongly that further investment in coaching, training, expert support for digital organizing is really key to this. Um, you know, a half day training, there's a big difference between a half day training on digital organizing and a master's in digital organizing. While we might not have the master's, we certainly need a higher level of guidance from those that are doing the work, have done the work and have the history within the work to be really properly showing folks how to be doing digital work that is effective online. Um, deploying communications, mobilizing and organizing uh, strategically to build power. Of course, making sure that there is this blend of these different elements across it seems to be one of the core parts of having a winning combination. Right now, um, you know, the, there seems to be an implication of this that not practicing what we know we need to be practicing could be a large part of the reason that we're not succeeding um, online with, with real meaningful uh, digital organizing methods. And, and that the, the preference right now, obviously, is for these kind of top-down communications-based, uh, you know, broadcast communications and social media approaches. So, uh, and last one, of course, is a willingness to shift culture and decentralize power. We hear a lot from our, our qualitative interviews that even if there's buy-in sometimes from, from higher ups, uh, kind of theoretically that, that in practice that becomes very difficult to do. Uh, this is particularly, I think, very important for Brussels. Um, we know that there's there's a, sometimes the, the, the theory and the practice don't line up. And um, we heard from a lot of people things, stories like, uh, you know, all my boss was really bought into uh, decentralized organizing, asked me to set up a program. I set up a pro program and he came back to me two months later and complained that everything everyone was saying was off brand, which of course is kind of the point. Um, you're, you're obviously, if you're going to decentralize and put it into the voice of those communities, then there's going to be some degree of being off brand. But there needs to be a willingness to build a culture around this and also to shift that culture towards a more decentralized approach. And then, of course, um, you know, one thing to kind of add to that too that we heard a lot from folks was among the challenges was the the kind of structures of, of European institutions was a significant factor, both in terms of funding, in terms of governance, in, in, in terms of different factors, both speaking about its kind of um, uh, relevance and importance for kind of protecting against populism, but being so rigid that it also kind of is potentially putting us at risk of a, a large populist rise eventually. Um, you know, it has protected, but because it is so rigid that there's a kind of a distance that's being created between populations and, of course, um, and of course, uh, you know, civil society, governing bodies, et cetera. And the last one, of course, is making sure that we measure uh, steps towards impact, making sure that all of this, that we can only create best practices with measurement, but also we're assuming that we're having impact uh, sometimes, and maybe we aren't unless we're actually finding ways to measure that. There's a lot of more development that's going on around that. There's a lot of questions of like, well, how do you measure beyond the vanity metrics of social reach or, or email list or whatever those kind of more immediate fundraising goals, you know, those more immediate short term things towards the longer term impact of decentralized organizing. Those are things that are very much in development, but it's very important that we keep the metrics 
um, at the core of this so we can continue to develop further best practices and more efficient methods and hopefully start to start to change the dynamic that is currently uh, existing across Europe. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, both uh, Ned and Rebecca. And before I bring uh, Lison in, uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up question that uh, perhaps sounds a little bit obvious, but does money have anything to do with this? Uh, we have seen in, in Europe, at least, that the, the far right, the populist and the establishment movements that you were referring to, uh, be it uh, the Brexit party in the UK or Vox in Spain, Le Pen in France, Wilders in, in the Netherlands, uh, are really good in throwing money on digital campaigning. I'll use an example from here in Belgium, where uh, the far-right party Vlaams Belang uh, has outspent all the other parties together on Facebook with their advertising. And as a result, of course, they have reached many more people with their message. To what degree do you think firepower, financial firepower, plays a role here in the way that you describe that the far-right seems to be winning that, uh, that battle? I, have a, I could probably have a go at that, but I, I want to pass it off to my to my compatriots here too. But one of the things that's 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 really key in that is yes, money is definitely a factor in terms of um, you know in terms of uh, it was identified as a major barrier having a lack of funds um, to be able to do stuff, and that's expected, of course, working with uh, you know progressive causes. I've been doing that for twenty years, and I always expect a lack of funds. But I think it often comes up too much as, as an excuse. In actuality, we see, for example, that the, the issue of fake news, for example, is not actually the case uh, uh, of just having overfunding. The, the, the organic reach of fake news has been shown has eight times the reach of um, of other stuff. And so I believe that uh, that that there's other factors than money that are going on around this that uh, that we need to consider. And it's too easy for us to fall back to money as the excuse when there's major other factors that have. Yeah, I'd also add um, in our survey results, we separated uh, the UK respondents from the rest of Europe. Uh, and you would expect um, some of the UK institutions with more funding might be doing better digital organizing uh, on the basis of this framework. And what we saw was it was the opposite. So. Um, the rest of Europe were uh, doing more decentralized organizing. Um, and our theory is that perhaps because they are smaller organizations, they are doing decentralized organizing out of necessity. It's much more uh, grassroots rather than in the UK where um, you know, there's a, a larger um, organizations or a, a longer chain of command um, that they're taking a much more top-down approach. So it's not necessarily the, the money that dictates the, the efficacy of those uh, two different operations. Lison, if I, if I may come to you, because you are actually working for a company that has developed a software based on the philosophy of empowerment, of uh, uh, changing the, the direction of power and enabling a simple activist to, to run a campaign on their own. Uh, and of course, you've worked with uh, huge campaigns in the US and in Europe with big political parties here in Europe, the liberals, EU institutions, but you also work with a lot of grassroots activists as well. Uh, in your experience, which are those things that uh, people can do to be effective in their efforts to communicate their message to a larger audience? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think the first thing is that um, they need to rely on their community. You can't do it on your own. And the important thing to remember, I think everyone knows this, but it's worth reminding it, power and influence comes from trust. And who do you trust? You trust your family, your friends, um, your the people you know more than any kind of efforts in marketing. So when you want to get your message out there in a powerful way, you need to leverage your community to share it, to recruit new people and to, to spread the word um, in a way that you will never be able to do so um, by any efforts and, and spendings that you could put in there. Um, and so in order to get people to do things like this, you need to have strong relationship with them and you need to empower them. You need to give them those responsibilities and you need to start by trusting them. Um, and it all comes back to everything that uh, we just saw in the report. It's, it's, the, it's, like, it's what organizing is, it's like, 
giving this responsibility, empowering people and, and use their power to um, to ultimately um, reach that, yeah, have a, a much bigger impact than you will be able to do on your own in a, like one way communication mode. One thing that stood out from what Ned and Rebecca were saying is that natural instinct sometimes that uh, civil society leaders feel or civil society organizations at large feel to channel messages from top to bottom and believing that this is the best way to reach people. Uh, in your experience, if you were sitting in front of a civil society leader, how would you argue against him or her and persuade them that, in fact, they need to allow their own members or their activists or even uh, people who are interested in their cause to take action themselves? What's the strongest argument to change the way civil society sometimes operates? I would say that um, like the few people in the rooms who are going to craft the message, they cannot be in the in the mind of everyone, uh, like every single of their audience. And the way like people who are in actual communities in the actual different audience are going to tell your message with their own words and with their own way, and you know from like different means, where maybe in person, maybe by phone, maybe by like knocking doors, like. Um, by all kinds of different of, of ways and with their own word, it can be much, much more powerful to convince people than just, you know, like you said, having top down messages all in one that, that will be this, yeah, the same thing for everybody, I would say. By the way, I should say that you're all welcome to offer your questions, be it through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. We are broadcasting this on a variety of platforms, and we already have a few coming in, and I'll, I'll bring those in because they're very interesting. Uh, Valentin from the European Greens, in fact, here in Brussels, uh, he asks that, as progressives, how can we compete online with the far right, who is much better and more ruthless in exploiting algorithms? Uh, that are fueling cognitive uh, biases and negative emotions like fear and anger. Uh, why would you respond to that? Uh, yeah, I think a good place. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, I, I, I would start by tying back to Lisan's point on um, relationship building. Um, uh, so one thing that's really um, important for, say, inoculating against disinformation or fighting the far the, the far right would be um, trust. And in order to build that trust, um, it relies on people um, building those existing relationships with their community members. Um, and there's another argument to make for um, doing that decentralized organizing where, where supporters and volunteers are um, communicating with their, their community members um, rather than just that um, top-down message um, coming uh, from up above. Yeah, and I would say uh, the main thing here, uh, absolutely great question, and this is very much the kind of question that we that we went in onto this with. Um, one thing is to recognize how disadvantaged it is. We are not on a level playing field. Um, I think the right can get away with, especially the kind of populist fear-based messages, can get away with, you know, uh, much more <laughs> basically online because things are the way things are structured, they're structured right now not to carry complex messages on our social media. They're structured in a way that actually favors keeping your attention because basically these social media uh, methods are not built for the most part for civic engagement. They're built for advertising models. And so they're going to keep things, messages that are out there that are going to be much more shocking, much more tapping into our emotions. Those are the ones that are gonna be pop up in the algorithm and spread more. Um, we on the, you know, on the progressive side of things are fighting for marginalized communities that have much more complex messages. Talking about the, the scientific backing and reason why we have to fight for environmentalism and save the planet, talking, fighting for the rights of marginalized communities like transgender people and, uh, you know, people of color and, and, and a lot of the, the, the intersection of different uh, marginalizations is a lot more complicated than a message than something like, oh, it's scary, there's migrants coming or whatever these kind of hate-based and fear-based messages that are out there. So we do have a lot more work to do, quite honestly. Um, but I do strongly believe that at the end of the day, we're gonna win the right because uh, because we have the truth and, and on our side. And we also, you have a lot of these 
the online ability to basically be able to connect people in a way that we didn't before. And so the solution itself, while it takes more to build those real relationships that are more personalized, that are actually putting people in touch with one another, that are actually building connections and understanding, um, while that takes more than just simply a Facebook ad buy, there are methods that we can do to get there. And in the end of the day, if we continue to de dedicate ourselves to that and look at what's working, um, I do believe that we're going to be able to win for a much more tolerant world and a world that's that's much more uh, just and fair and maybe even if we're lucky, save the environment in time. So, um, or our species disappears. So it's a big challenge and it's not as easy, I think, as the right has in the current circumstances, but really being able to find ways to push more connections of, of, of relationships, which is really what this kind of decentralized model means. Um, is what is going to eventually be able to uh, to help us win? I think one thing that we have found in our in our work on the digital domain is that not everybody wants to be a campaigner. Not everybody wants to be that person who uh, steps up and uh, expresses a view, whether on social media or in a town square. Uh, there are some that are indeed much more vocal. There are others who would rather sign a petition or contribute financially to a cause they believe in. Uh, are there different tricks? Are there different ways of engaging those varied types of, of activists? I can take this one. Um, yes, like there, there should be, you have to, you have to get different paths and different ways for people to engage. You cannot have like one size fit all and let everybody like fit in, in the same mold because you're right, like people don't have like the same uh, means, they don't have like the the same uh, willingness to, to support your cause, but they want to do it. You, um, I, I want to take an example of Octree, which is an Australian charity fighting uh, against poverty. And in the past, they used to have two ways. Like um, it was either you will be a full time volunteer or you will um, just uh, help one time. And there was no in between. And they realized that every year they had to like we on board again um all the all their supporters um every time they had their big annual event instead of like keeping people um to be part of the organization all year long and that was because they had like two extreme uh paths for people and nothing in between um and so it's it's really important that you listen to your people and that you allow them to contribute in the way they want to do it but also that you push them to do more and more so it should be gradual and you shouldn't think in silos you shouldn't see your donors on one side and your volunteers on the other side um, everyone can be a, a bit of everything you just need to push them in the right direction to listen to them and keep all these those relationship and and um yeah based on like the action they are doing suggesting other things that are relevant to them yeah, just to add to that too, that's one of the reasons, I, I, I don't know if someone can say this, but that's one of the reasons we like tools like Nation Builder that are actually have a large set of of, um, of options. Basically, it's a, it's a full toolbox that has a, a bunch of different ways in which you can engage people and interact with people. Um, systems like that are really good, whatever. And, and if you're not using a system like that, then you really should be partnering different systems and different approaches because there is no successful method for digital organizing that is not holistic. Digital organizing is about meeting people where they are. And because people are in different places, you have to have different approaches in which to find them. Um, so that means, you know, you're going to, you know, my, my dad's now on Zoom, which is super exciting um, <laughs> because it's 2020 and everybody's in Zoom. So he's on his 70s, but we can do Zoom for older populations. But a few years ago, we couldn't. Um, but we need to consider that there's going to be people that are going to, you know, really respond to email and engage with email. There are going to be people that are going to do online actions in a much higher way and be planning and be leaders and be strategy. And then there's other folks that are going to just want to do the kind of more collectivist end of throwing their support by by adding their names or whatnot. And so that holistic approach that's absolutely right is super essential to actually having success in this work. Also, super good reason to watch out for the, the shiny, flashy thing that just seems cool. And like, I'm going to solve the world through TikTok. Like, TikTok might be great, but as part of a bigger strategy approach where we need to know that not everyone's on TikTok. And, <laughs> and also, as we like to say here, like, the methods come first over the tech, the methods, the techniques to follow the, the methods. And one of those core methods for functionally building relationships is to make sure to have different ways of speaking to different communities and populations. Rebecca. Um, yeah, I was just going to agree with Lisan and Ned. I think they, they hit the nail on the head. It's really important not to, to take a one-size-fits-all approach to this. 
Now, we, 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 you know, you all talked a little bit about the path that uh, we need to take our, our audience, our, our activists, uh, those that we work with. And um, and I think the, the, that is a little bit of a difficult uh, element to introduce to digital campaigning. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, preparation and strategy and thinking and identif targeting uh, different uh, segments in your audience and then identifying the best way to engage each of that audience. Do you think, is it realistically for, for a small NGO to, uh, to engage in such sophisticated work? Um, I can start with this. I think Tectonica can speak to, to some of the, the more well borne out uh, thinking on the intricacies of, of digital, but um, from my perspective, from as someone who's who's worked with campaigns, um, both large and small, um, we shouldn't be ignoring some of that lower hanging fruit of of which platforms people are on, um, and uh, particularly with Twitter. So what what I'm seeing um, with um, different major European political parties, but also smaller organizations. Um, that people are having an over-reliance um, on Twitter, which relative to other platforms like, say, Facebook or WhatsApp, um, very few people are on it. Um, so a very easy step to take is just make sure you are um, reaching people where they are. Um, our head of digital at GQR, Joy Craig, her Twitter bio says, like most people, um, I'm not on Twitter. Um, and I think, again, that, that just hits the nail on the head. Twitter works like an echo chamber. Um, people are putting out ideas to to a like-minded group of, of journalists or people in the same uh, Brussels or Westminster bubble. So they're not really shifting their views. Um, so I think as an important step, um, a, a good place to start for for both large and small organizations is to make sure you're you're starting out in the right places to to reach the people that you you need to reach. Yeah, I think. Um. Oh, oh go ahead. No, no, you go for it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll be quick. Um, I think, uh, yeah, well, if you if you don't have a lot of uh, of means, if you're a small company, then you even more need to rely on your community. And so you don't have to come up with something super sophisticated, but with the right tools in place, you kind of you are able to automate and, and to scale uh, those different pathways for people. I would say at least figuring out um, and being able to identify people who are willing to volunteer and what type of volunteer work they are willing to do. Um, at the very minimum can be really, really powerful. And then having like, um, you, you can use if, if you, if, if you have the right tools, you can do automated series to like onboard these people and train them and equip them with the tools they can, uh, they need to do the work. And, and that is going to ultimately take a lot of work out of your end and, and contribute to, to your plan and to your objective and to your results. Yeah, and just to support that too, like I think there is this idea that this is only something for really well resourced like NGOs, and I'd say it's actually the opposite. It's, it's that if you want to to grow your power as an NGO, you're going to have to, you know, I, I think the best way to do it is to use supporters to to grow your movement, to grow your cause, to get your message out there. And as, as Rebecca had mentioned earlier, the amazing thing when we we actually looked at kind of a UK sample specific sample compared to the rest of Europe, thinking there's all these very well funded uh, UK organizations that of course we assumed, well, maybe they'll be doing a lot more like decentralized organizing. And it actually came out the exact opposite way, which was that um, the the segments of, of organizations that were more well-funded and were uh, larger actually were doing less decentralized organizing and, and weighted more heavily on top-down communications. So our, our kind of, uh, our suspicion around that, though we don't have evidence in the report itself, is that a lot of the organizations, you know, that are less resourced have to rely on decentralized organizing, have to rely on their supporters more to be building those relationships within communities, uh, have to be relying on these techniques that really rely on the power of supporters because they don't have the option of money. But the impact of this, you know, is, is that while, you know, if you're a small NGO in Hungary that's that's trying to fight authoritarianism there, you might need to rely on decentralized approaches more to, to get it out there because you can't make a big Facebook ad buy. A lot of the organizations that are larger are actually kind of ignoring the potential of uh, techniques that are more decentralized or are, are actually uh, you know, really engaging people more, reaching out to people more and, and creating more silos themselves by just relying on the quick short-term uh, return on investments. And so 
Um, I absolutely do not think that this is something that's just for uh, big things. In fact, uh, I think that digital organizing in general and digital campaigning is really uh, uh, is actually, if anything, most important for those organizations that are smaller and trying to build and trying to get more impact um, with limited resources. If I may ask, if I I want to take the conversation a little bit to the actual platforms, you know, where this organizing happens, be it via mail and otherwise, we do rely a lot on social media. And among the civil society community, perhaps others too, there are often... Um, uh, hesitation to be active in, in certain uh, social media platforms so for a variety of reasons, justified or not. Uh, how would you advise them to go about it? You know, and Obviously, I'm talking about the debate around Facebook or YouTube and everything that goes on there, uh, but other platforms too. So how would you advise uh, CSOs to engage those platforms that they might not uh, agree with? Uh, and what other alternatives there are for them to, to engage in campaigning. Uh, Ned, if you want to go first. Okay, I'm on the spot for that one. Um, I mean, the really great thing that we're seeing right now is that um, they're, they're, like, I don't think we're quite there with the development of tools and technologies. And again, like, at the end of the day, it's not about specifically about the tools that are that are there it's it's what the tools allow us to do and we need to focus on you know actually how we're building relationships online especially in 2020 where there's you know special challenges um but but you know it's it's for me there's there's a real field of tools that are developing and, and looking great out there um i'm you know any system that's out there really at a core you need as a crm which is you know going to be your your way that you're managing relationships um, between your organization or your movement or your party and the population out there. So that's really key there. You know, data has this kind of like dirty word attached to it in a lot of cases because data has been used in really bad contexts. But data is just like writing. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. We use it all the time. Last time we made a list of people to invite to our birthday party, we use data. Um, and so like a CRM is a really core place because, at, you know, to really actually build democracy and civic engagement a day-to-day -day basis that relies upon us to actually be building relationships, relationships from, you know, the basis of communities within those communities and to reaching out to, you know, to folks to, to engage them, to talk to them, to have dialogue. And so there's this kind of beautiful field of tools that are, that are being developed out there that do different things. Some of them are CRMs, some of them are, are target advocacy tools, some of them are, uh, st you know, straight up relational tools. That's a whole kind of area of, of organizing. Um, where we did see in the report that there needs to be more and that there isn't, uh, there isn't enough is these tools that uh, allow organizers basically a higher level of collaboration with supporters and activists so that there's a higher degree of asynchronous communication and uh, participation in the actual development of strategy. So that's, that's a little kind of like nerdy talk around organizing, but what I'm hoping to see basically is more things out there. What we heard was one of the holdups too, was, was more tools out there that allowing people to to be much more deeply involved in the, in the particular development of strategy of how to actually reach people into communities to build those relationships and to activate them. And so I feel like that's, you know, if we're going to go in a direction of where things are going, that's where we're hoping to see things go because at the end of the day, tools that allow organizers to do their campaigning uh, more easily are the tools that we really want to, uh, to, to see and what, and what organizers themselves within the survey actually named as the primary um, you know, primary tools for basically being able to do their work better. Lishon, uh, I mean, Nation Builder is, uh, enables users to uh, utilize all possible platforms. Uh, do you think the, there is also a need for campaigners to also adjust the way they speak in those different platforms? Like, uh, like Ned and Rebecca earlier said, it's not just a about the vehicle, is about the objective you have and the message you're trying to communicate. Uh, do you have tips on how campaigners, uh, be it from civil society or otherwise, can engage and uh, utilize different platforms to engage their audience? Mm, yeah, so I mean, I. I won't give like communication advice. What, what I can say is, and Ned said it a little bit, it's like 
um, using different platforms, different social media is mean to meet people where they're at and because some people are more comfortable in some in certain place, but it, it should all be with the aim of bringing these people back in your database so that you can re-engage with them, keep the follow-up and build a relationship on the long term. Um, so I think the like, Thinking about your social media is, is a good thing, but also think, um, have the basic in place. And the, the, the biggest basic in place you need to have is a really engaging website. The website is at the heart of like the digital strategy and you need to be able to bring back people to your website. The website then needs to be engaging and push people to take action and, and to start building, engaging the conversation with you and, and, and you know, start um, contributing to your campaigns. Um, and, yeah, Ned has been like building those kind of websites um, for our customers and for other over um, the past years, and has been really good at at you know creating an experience. And like when you drive back people there, um, they are they have multiple points of entries to engage the way they want to engage with you, and then you can use that data and start working with them. So it all come back again to you need to build this relationship. You need to be in conversation with people and for that you need to have like the right information the right tools um and and of course the crm rebecca if i come to you um, if an organization let's say a civil society organization is just starting out in this world of digital campaigning and, and organizing what should be the first steps that they take in this journey uh, in an effort to make the most of the opportunities of the digital domain? That's uh, a great question. Um, I might uh, defer to Ned for some follow-up, but my my initial thoughts is, is again, this, this recurring theme on relationship building. So I think inherently the, the members of this organization have existing relationships with with their community, uh, with their colleagues. And I think kind of uh, rather than starting from scratch, they should um, uh, take stock of, of the resources that they already have um, with those existing relationships. And they will, um, I think that's a, that's a good jumping off point for then expanding their network of volunteers and supporters um, rather than just uh, starting from, from zero. Um, but I might uh, defer to Ned to see uh, what you think on that one? Well, you sign up for Nation Builder, and then you hire Tectonica, and then no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I mean honestly, my 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 actual my actual response is, is don't wait. I think a lot, I see a lot of organizations really wait uh, to start to list build. Honestly, to start to engage people, um, they I, I feel like there's this kind of like fear that happens with people for using techniques that are more engaging, and so people kind of end up defaulting. And there's much you know there's much more history of communication, so people end up like. Like, oh, I'm gonna be able to make real movement by just blaring my narrative over and over again on repeat without a chance to actually ha invite people to the table. And what we find is in the social media age, that doesn't work. We know that doesn't work. We know that people have a different expectation about what basically uh, who to trust and, and what voices to listen to because we have voices from all of our peers constantly around us, those that are engaged on social media. And it's, it's changed the expectation that people have around what, you know, like where information comes from and how to hear it differently and how to believe it. And one of those things is that we start operating from a gap in trust. Uh, that's just the reality of the situation that we have in the current moment. And that, uh, you know, that leads to, you know, kind of more traditional uh, political parties or press or politicians starting from a place where they're much more distrusted by the general population than they used to be. And um, anything that smells of inauthenticity uh, kind of creates these immediate like ruptures and, and, and offers the opportunity for things like fake news and whatever to take hold. And so how do we really uh, take a place in that context that's going to be effective is we're going to actually kind of flip the flip the script a little, flip the dynamics so that it's not so much about one way lecturing and throwing down messages at people, but giving people themselves a place in um, and having a say. So if, if people don't see themselves in a movement, they're not likely to, to trust it, basically. People need to be able to see themselves in, in whatever cause, whatever movement you're saying, and they need to have a place where they can have their voice, uh, their say, 
their involvement. And that's a little bit more trickier than just blaring messages to people. But at the core of it is really about having the opportunity to make the ask to invite people to engage. And so a lot of people get really overwhelmed by all this. They're like, let's just go back to social media and post our announcements and not talk with people on social media. But it needs to be more complicated than that. It needs to be at the core of it. It needs to be to give people opportunities to engage with you in a, in a much more um, in a much more real way that we actually have the options to do online. So, you know, I would say for people that are just starting this, the real key is don't be afraid. Start asking people if they want to get involved with stuff and start, uh, you know, getting them to sign up for things. And that way you build your list, you start to have an audience, you start to talk to people. Um, there's no reason that uh, even the smallest NGO can't do this. As I said, we all did this on our last birthday party. So it's it's not it's not something that's that's magic or is out there. It's something that we can do on various scales and various levels. Uh, and at the core of it is really inviting people to, to the table and ensuring that that's at the core of your operating practice, rather than just getting out a megaphone and shouting at people your messages. We know that doesn't work anymore. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a crucial point because it's something that it's often done and it uh, switches off people more than anything else. That um, we treat our audience uh, as passive recipients of whatever wisdom we might have up, come up with, uh, be it a statement or, or a tweet or a, or a very beautiful image we create. And we don't ask them to take any action in that re regard. And, and again, in our experience, we have noticed that simple things like uh, asking somebody to support a statement or ask them to share something really can make a difference in the quality of engagement they have, uh, let alone encouraging them and empowering them to create the message themselves and then giving them a platform to share that message. I think that's pretty crucial. Now, in the last uh, six months, uh, a lot can be said about 2020, most of it negative, unfortunately. But whether we like it or not, we have all been forced to operate in this digital world much more than we were used to or much more than we are comfortable to do. Have you seen an improvement as a result? Uh, I, mean, I know that your report was... Uh, you know, being developed uh, before and during this, uh, all this uh, happened. But did you see in this in 2020 a shift, an improvement perhaps in the quality of digital campaigning and digital organizing from civil society and activists? Ned, uh, you can go first. I'm sorry. Go listen. Go listen. <laughs> No, I would, yeah, I was going to say that what we've noticed with our customers is that um, two things, like one, uh, the people who already have um, an infrastructure in place, they've been able to adapt and to be agile and, you know, to, to keep doing the work and going even beyond um, this year. And the second thing is that for everyone else uh, who was like more reluctant or hesitating, um, it's it's been the occasion because they had no choice to kind of like have to do it and get on board the people who were you know less um, less keen to to digitalize their activities and because there there was no choice it was a good way to like um, re like rework the strategy and, and get at it and so we've seen really really cool um, um, initiatives uh, that happen across our customer base and. Um, one thing I wanted to say also to echo like the what Ned said at the last question is that if you're hesitating, um, like it's important to start now as soon as you can, even if it's by small steps, because organizing it works, but it takes a long time um, to get in place and to be super efficient. But once it's here, it's actually super, super powerful. And that's what we've seen with the example in Georgia of like Stacey Abrams, um, who's done that huge work of organizing um, in the state after she lost the election. And um, in, in 2020, um, Georgia for the first time like switched um, to, to uh, Democrats after 28 years. And that's not just because the campaign, Biden's campaign has been there on the last line and super effective, it's because that deep, groundwork has been done quite a, a long time before. So that's really something I wanted to share. Yeah, to add to that too, I think one of the things that's really interesting, it, it does take time. It's about relationships and building community and building uh, 
longer term relationships. Um, we saw this very funny because we talked a lot with with folks in Europe uh, that have seemed to think that like Black Lives Matters and the, the movement that happened this past summer just popped out of nowhere. But in reality, we know that organizers have been working on this and pushing this message at points where they weren't actually accepted into the into the mainstream dialogue. It's, it's been for, for quite a long time. And, and it only was through that work over the years that basically there was enough to be able to build to get a consensus and it hit a crisis point actually, the additional crisis point was able to force it into the mainstream enough that they were really able to reach a kind of community consensus about the importance of, 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 of police brutality specifically towards people of color. And so it's, you know, these things don't happen as magic, even though if you're not up close to it, it can seem like it does sometimes. But for us to 2020, yeah, was had like a ton of really bad stuff. I mean, it is a failure of policy, a lot of the, the cause of the death and the loss of jobs. And like, there's been, there's been failure policy in, in many different ways, not just a pandemic, but a failure policy in, in many different places and many different forms, um, which has brought things to the forefront. That's one, but we've seen a lot of tragedy. So that's whatever we talk about 2020, we can't ignore that. There's been, there's been horrible tragedy across the board. But in terms of, of how it's impacted digital organizing, yes, we have other populations that are much more willing to be online and to engage in these digital methods that have been holding out, my dad on Zoom. Um, <laughs> you know, all these folks that basically are able to engage in a way that they weren't quite as willing to, to go online and, and aren't having to. But here's the thing that I really see right now as, as kind of the, the, the little beautiful, like, silver lining of 2022, which is that it's, it goes back to this authenticity thing, where, where authenticity was so missing. And as we kind of further professionalized political leadership, there was this growing sense of distrust continually more and more. And I think this is importantly, like super important for Brussels to really listen to too. And at the end of the day, in many ways, 2020 has forced us to not have a choice around bringing our humanness uh, in into things. Um, the, the presence of live streams like we have right now out of people's houses has been a way for people to communicate as an alternative to what would be more traditional ways of leaders speaking. And I love it. I mean, we've seen dogs in the background, partners in the background, mishaps go on in people's kitchens. Like there has been a force, uh, a component of humanness that I think is actually really valuable to bring to the uh, to political leadership because it's through humanness that we connect with one another and we're actually able to make political change. The one last thing I want to throw out there that's 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 really important is that we know in 2022 that there's uh, like we heard from our report very clearly that, that the actual kind of like shift of identity or 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 real commitment to a cause where people bring it into their communities, where people carry it with them, where people are really fully engaged happens for the most part, honestly, offline. Traditionally has happened offline. And so there's a lot of, of, of you know, you really can't do that you know, in general, it was it's kind of gotten to the point where those were usually accompanied by digital methods that were happening online. But we've also seen, of course, in 2020, because of social distancing, that a lot of those connections, the deeper ways of committing to organizing, to civic engagement, to political organizing, really aren't available to us right now. So there's a lot of people doing some really incredible work, creative work of finding ways to engage more deeply, more meaningfully online, moving beyond the collectivism, getting ways that we can organize and have a strategy input uh, you know, connections between each other uh, more and more deeply online, but it is a challenge. We are not there yet. And it's a, it's a place where we need to keep pushing the envelope. And quite honestly, a lot of the experimentations that happened in 2020, we still don't have the data to say whether they're actually effective or not. So we're still learning. Nobody's, you know, nobody prepared for the pandemic. So we're still learning. We're still seeing a lot of what of those techniques are actually effective. But uh, we can probably carry on this conversation for a while, but we can only impose on your time for this long. Uh, I just want to thank you all for uh, your contribution in this conversation. It was hugely interesting and educative for me and everybody else taking part. Uh, I'd I like to invite all our viewers to, to get in touch, whether with NED at Tectonica or Rachel at GQR or, or Lizon at Nation Builder, uh, if you want to work more on these areas. And, and we promise that we will continue working in this field because we do believe it's important for, for civil society uh, organized or individuals uh, to come forward and make the most of the opportunities that are there. So again, a big thank you to the three of you for taking your time to, to talk to us. Uh, a big thank you to all those that tuned in throughout Europe. Please stay tuned in and engaged and we look forward to seeing you in our future events uh, not so long from now. Have a nice afternoon. Thanks a lot.